welcome to the Playing With Power podcast. I am Mike, and my co-host can introduce himself right now. Hi, this is Ben. This is our first podcast, and we're delighted to share it with you. So we're going to be going back through the original issues of Nintendo Power magazine, starting with the very first one in July of 1998. And uh, the reason why this came about is I have the vast majority of the issues sitting in my uh, garage. And um, I asked my friends on Facebook, hey, what should I do with these uh, Nintendo Power magazines? And uh, everyone, someone su- suggested uh, you should do a podcast. So uh, here we are. And now I know uh, Mike's done podcasts before. Um, and he's also a comedian. You want to talk about that a little bit? What, it's listed as one podcast in iTunes, but with several shows all in one feed. And I'm on the Technobabble one. And I came about that by uh, striking up a attempted flirt with one of the uh, bingo patrons at the bingo hall I work at. But found out she was married. But she was cool, so I thought, well, what the hell, I'll make a friend anyway. And then she decided to that her husband was getting antsy and that she tried to set me up on a play date with him, so to speak. And, uh, and got us to talk on Skype. And he's a nerd into like geek, oh. like nerd slash geek. Another two different things. I equate the nerd as the more technological uh, savvy person and the geek is the more, you know, lore, pop culture. Sure. Well, that's funny. He, I thought you would have uh, found this person from doing stand-up, but that's well, interesting. You got it through your through your job. Well, yes, but the stand-up gave because I was doing the stand-up. They were like he wanted someone with a bit of a you know outgoing personality, and you know by doing stand-up, it made me seem like a viable candidate rather than just you know some shy some schmuck whatever. like me out the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's just like, oh, a comedian, maybe he can make the podcast amusing. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And uh, you can find the uh, episodes of Geek Fallout, specifically the Technobabble episodes, and find out, you know, if I, uh, if I make it nice or not. Right. They decided to promote me from guest from the first episode to co-host to the second episode. Nice. Well, let's. Uh, I've listened to them; they're they're very good. But let's let's dig it on our own podcast here. <laughs> Enough pimping. Let's. What <laughs> do we have plugging. to offer? So I want to talk about the cover first and foremost. Uh, so the, cl- the claymation cover. <laughs> the claymation version of Super Mario Two. Why is Mario blue? That is a good. I think that's what happens in that game when you get like a mushroom or a power up. Don't you I... let the colors invert? I haven't played Mario World 2 in a long time, but I really don't recall seeing Mario do a palette swap. <laughs> I think that's what it was, from, from just, just from looking at the, the innards of the Nintendo Power issue here. But I, I want to point something out. I don't know if you've ever played uh, Donkey Kong Country. Did the, you play uh, that? Yes, I remember the uh, lovely introduction with the uh, Donkey Kong theme, and then they decide to hip-hop it up. After oh, yeah. seeing, mm-hmm. uh, after uh, old Donkey Kong is rocking on the chair to the old grandma phone, and then they bring in new Donkey Kong, and it's like boom, 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 boo, 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 doo, doo, doo. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, they had a drum beat. They got to make this for the kids. This ain't your daddy's Donkey Kong. <laughs> so the uh, the bad guy that's chasing after Mario here, blue blue Mario here, on the cover, his name is uh, Wart in this game. Yeah. But he looks almost exactly like King K. Rule, which is the bad guy <laughs> from Donkey Kong Country. He does! And uh, the, the claymation looks nothing like the uh, wart that's in the game either. Uh, you know, and, <clears throat> and you think like, okay, maybe they screwed up the cover. And because like Mario's got like the blue cap and he's got like what, a red insignia for his name instead of white with the red letter. Right. And... You think, okay, well, this was this may have just been a screw up, but then you see the the Mario art in the margins of the article, mm-hmm. and it alternates between the Mario we know, even though he's drawn with a more Goomba like face with jowls, like Droopy Dog, right. but he's got the right colors, 
and then he'll alternate to Blue Hat Mario, and they never seem to address this. It's like nobody even noticed. We have a regular Mario and a blue <laughs> blue Mario. Blue Mario. <laughs> like maybe like, they were still like, getting <laughs> used to uh, drawing Mario. I mean, this is first yeah. issue, you know. Color, color palette issues are, are or, common in 80s cartoons, so I wonder if they use similar artists. Um, yeah. Or in proto, yeah, or right. a proto Wario. So if you actually flip on the inside cover, something uh, interesting I've never noticed before, um, looking at it again, but if you looked at these cheesy actors that are doing the power line to the pros, they're holding the first copy of Nintendo Power, but the cover is not claymation, it's illustrated. So I'm wondering if their first cut of making the cover was an illustration, and at some point someone someone had the grand idea of making a claymation for some reason. That I passed that part up. I'm going to have to look at it again. What got me was what was on the other side of the page, saying Nintendo, the new bi-monthly magazine. Yep. Which is nice to know that you know it it came out of the closet as opposed to the cis monthly <laughs> magazines. Oh, <laughs> well, it's nice to know. know it's nice to know they're they, proud. Oh yeah, and it's not just that. I mean, there's also Birdo, who we'll get to oh, a yeah. little, who we'll get some, to in a minute. Some controversy and, uh, there. Oh yeah, like the one of the first trans villains, right? And you know, they just so they got the you got the bi magazine, the cis villains. So it's nice to know that for the '80s, this was very politically open-minded even accidentally so yeah <laughs> so the inside cover we've got the advertisement for the power line to the pros which is uh, nintendo's hotline if you have trouble with your game and you can call someone and uh, get tips on how to get through it so apparently um if you look at the actors in the photo you have to meet a certain criteria number one you have to be white um oh, yeah. number two you are issued a gray puffy jacket with your name on it um, number three, you have to wear blue jeans, and number four, you have to wear white tennis shoes. Oh yeah, you got you got to be preppies, so because you know because you know what black kids in the eighties were doing. They were just hanging out in the ghettos with their boom oh, boxes right. and their and their graffiti tags, and so you know they they weren't playing Nintendo. They were too uh, they were too street for that. But they were break dancing in the streets on cardboard. Oh yeah, to the Rocksteady crew and. Right. Meanwhile, these these preppies, they all look like like slightly lamer versions of Freddy from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> it's like if he just applied himself and actually went to preparatory school instead of just, you know, losing the jacket and walking around with the ascot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, don't even start on the ascot. That is, that is something else. That's not even like a thing of the times. Anyways, we're, get, we're getting off track here. <laughs> All right, so moving on, their cover is Super Mario Brothers 2. Let's dig into it. So um, what were some of the things that you learned about Super Mario Brothers 2 from reading this that you, that you didn't know before? Well, the interesting thing is, is I had a late start with Nintendo Power magazine because I remember seeing the Claymation cover when I was going through Zellers. And... I uh, tried skimming it, but hold on. For what is? Can you go back? What is Zellers? Oh, it's a Canadian uh, department store where is the that, lowest price is the law, according what to is, the jingle uh, from the eighties. Is that like equivalent to like a Walmart? It, uh, it it's the it's a type of store that Walmart crushed. <laughs> okay, so it's no longer around. I think it's in a very reduced capacity, if it exists at all. Okay, and I would remember going through the aisle, seeing this claymation thing, and I just thought. Well, I don't know what Mario is, but he looked kind of cool. Then I tried flipping through the magazines, and, you know, it was all about video games, and I didn't, uh, came from a bit of a, uh, a less than affluent family, so it was a while before I got my own Nintendo. I just remember Nintendo was something that other kids had that I didn't, uh... And then when I did, I had to rent my games from a, a video store, because I didn't mm. have enough money to buy them. Uh, what about you? What was your Nintendo experience? Were you like a little better off, or were you like on the uh, fringes of Nintendo? Well, mine was kind of unique. Um, I actually lived overseas in Italy at the time, and um, I got my Nintendo. I want to say eighty, eighty nine, maybe eighty eight. 
Oh, so, um, so the so the first few issues of Nintendo Power wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have meant anything to you. No, I didn't. I mean, I might have got. I don't remember exactly <coughs> when I got my Nintendo, but um, being overseas, I didn't really have a whole lot of opportunity to play new games aside from the ones that my friends had, who were also from the United States or from anywhere that had the NTSC system. That's um, they basically had. If you were in USA, you had a USA system. If you were in Europe, you had a PAL system. And what that meant was that you couldn't use your um, USA or Canadian cartridges in the European systems and vice versa. They just wouldn't work. Did um, they look the same? Because I remember... Uh, yeah, they I looked was, exactly the same. Because when I was going through a store, I remember... I don't remember where the store was, but a guy had a Nintendo device hooked up and he had Jeopardy, but mm-hmm. it was a top-loading Nintendo. Well, no, and they it, actually... Nintendo did actually come out with a top-loading uh, NES way late in its life cycle. I want to say well after the Super Nintendo was around. Um, Which was a good idea, but way too late. Right. Well, I mean, it was already of, at the end of its life cycle anyways. It's kind of like of the equivalent of you know the, the miniature versions that come out or the slimline versions of consoles that come out these days, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I just thought, like, it, how many of us would have avoided those, uh, those cartridge errors, like blowing on it? Because <laughs> most, most of the time it seemed like it was the spring... That would give out, and then you wouldn't have the connection. So if you had a top loader, less moving parts makes a more mechanically viable product. Yeah, it was interesting how they came up with the whole, you load it from the front and then slam it down. I guess, and, it, uh, I, guess I don't they, know where like the, the, the whole blowing into the cartridge thing came about, but it's something we all just kind of knew. You know? it's, yeah, it's something we all just, it, 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 we intuited it. It was and in the, the, con- the human consciousness of, well, there must be <laughs> dirt on the end of this thing. i got to blow it out. You know? yeah, if, it's, if it's dust, you blow it off. Pretty much. So, yeah. So, anyways, I had a um, subscription to Nintendo Power from, uh, I just looked in the box, from about 1999, 1989 until about um, 1999. So... Hmm. For about 10 years, I had a subscription, and while I was living overseas until about 96, that was my only uh, avenue into video games, period. So I didn't even know that, for example, PlayStation existed until I moved back. <laughs> um, and I knew about like Sega Genesis and stuff because I had friends that had it. Um, and I'd see stuff in stores and be like, oh, what is this You know, 3DO business? It's not Nintendo. It must be garbage, you know? So I was a total like Nintendo uh, fanboy for a long oh. time. Same uh, with as a me. Result. Nintendo was the only thing that existed <clears throat> when I became aware of video games. Like I had to find out later on about like uh, uh, ColecoVision. Oh yeah. And, uh, I had like friends. I had like a an, an I, Atari. Yeah. And the, I just the looked at the going like. What what is this? This doesn't make any sense. The first video game console had to be Nintendo, you know. Yeah, this um, is weird. That's because yeah, that was one of the things I grew up with was the Atari twenty six hundred playing Yars Revenge, Solar Fox, mm-hmm. uh, Berserk. But uh, when I saw Nintendo at my friend's place for the first time, I, I just freaking near lost my shit because <laughs> you you see Zelda and you got like a menu and it's got like words on it you can read. Right. And I'm like, wait, wait a second, these aren't massive blocks. They're like tiny blocks, and they're arranged so tightly together that you can read words, and, you know, they can actually, like, say things on it rather than just like, here's a screen, move around and figure out what doesn't kill you. Right. <laughs> and no, uh, I remember getting fr- it and for Christmas, and um, I remember when we first hooked it up and tried to play it, my, my uh, dad and I tried to play it together, and our initial instinct was the first jump you get to Mario. We you know, it took us a, a number of tries in Super Mario Brothers just to get to the first like jump area where there's a gap. And our reaction, or our initial reaction to this, was to physically move the controller up in the air to jump, <laughs> to jump Mario across this gap. And some, you know, sometimes we thought, oh, if we jump in the air, it makes it go higher. You know, so we're sitting there in our living room jumping up, and of course it's doing... Absolutely nothing, you know. <laughs> but that's the kind of that was like the natural reaction. There's an accelerometer in the controller. I'm sure of it. Well, when, it, when I saw them come out with the Wii, 
you know, many years later, I thought, of course, you know, for anyone that doesn't hasn't grown up playing video games, their initial reaction is to move it physically, and this is probably like going to change, you know, bring some new people into the video game realm as a result because they just well, move the controller. Oh yeah, and uh, I can't remember when I exactly started uh, subscribing to Nintendo Power. As we go on mm-hmm. in further episodes, I'm sure. One of these covers will strike nostalgia as like this was the first one I, I got in the mail. But, well, uh, just was, before we started recording this episode, I pulled out the box of Nintendo Powers from my garage, and the first one I have is actually the fourth issue with Zelda Two on the front. Ooh. So we'll get to that one. It was a. I got the first thing I became about uh, when I became aware of Nintendo Power was uh, seeing my going to a friend's place, and he had Dragon Warrior. But I just thought, you know, this game is kind of cool, but I kind of don't know where to go. And he's like, and he brings out, like, these physical maps. And it's got, like, a whole list of, like, which shops have uh, herbs and weapons and how right. much they cost. And I'm like, where did you get all this? Yeah. And he's like, like it, it came with my subscription to Nintendo Power. And Nintendo I'm like, power. Nintendo Power. Yeah, we got to see if we can actually get that <laughs> song. Yeah. Like ripping it off. All right, so back to Mario Mario Brothers Two. So I learned a lot by by looking at this and uh, and reading about Super Mario Brothers Two. So first what? off, I, I want to talk about the description of the four characters because you can play as Mario, Luigi, Toad, or Princess. Oh yeah, they don't Toad. they don't call her Pe- Peach or anything, by the way. It's just Princess. Yeah, yeah. Peach doesn't become Peach until she becomes blonde. Every <laughs> other thing refers to her as Princess Toadstool, and when you look at her in uh, this. Princess, mm-hmm. as Princess described in there, she can float, which is like pretty cool to make to give like such a useful power to a girl right. for such a, an early game. Mm-hmm. But seeing the art again, she looks just like she did in the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Right. And you know, from what I uh, and even in Super Mario Brothers one, two, and three, she was a brunette and referred to Toadstool. She wasn't really referred to Peach until Super Mario World, and that's when she got the blonde hair. Mm. So I wonder if she's a completely different person, as as well as Princess Daisy from Super Mario Land. Right. So I wonder if they try to diverge Princess Daisy and Princess Toadstool. I mean, Princess Toadstool in half, so it became Daisy and Peach then. You know, <laughs> yin and yang, yeah. if you will, of the princesses. Also on the uh, cover arch, we get to see Toad, but he doesn't have the red dots as we all know him to have. Mm -hmm. He's got purple dots, which is sort of like a subliminal tie into the actual Super Mario Bros. 2, which came Mm -hmm. out in Japan and came out here in Super Mario All-Stars as the Lost Levels, which introduced a poison mushroom, Mm -hmm. where if you touched it, you took damage, shrunk, or friggin' died. And that's what this toad looks like. So it's like a neat little nod yeah. to the game we weren't getting because apparently Japan thought, "Oh no, these gaijin, they're, they 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 just won't get it. They're too they're too dumb." Right. So here's what I like the quote they put under Toad. They just say, "He <laughs> is the worst jumper." <laughs> like wow, that's awesome. That's what they get to say about the Toad's introduction to the world. This is the first game he's in. And that's how we introduce him. He is the worst jumper. Yeah, where he's not, where he's not a uh, brick block, right? Because if you remember the manual from Super Mario Brothers, it says that all the people of the Mushroom Kingdom were transformed into bricks, which makes Mario a genocidal monster when he's just tearing ass through the Mushroom Kingdom. Right. Unless you're unless you're just hitting question blocks, you're you're just smashing people who would have been restored back. I mean, when you defeat Bowser, I just imagine that you're just leaving scattered limbs all over the place once they, once the spell is broken and they get restored to flesh. <laughs> like, so why I, have that in there? It's like, you're going to be smashing bricks. By the way, the bricks are people. Have fun. So when I played um, Mario 2 back in the day, I never actually owned it. I had the first one, and a friend of mine had the second one, and I played at his house. And I just didn't like it. It was just kind of weird. It was totally different from the first one. It didn't seem like it was a true sequel. Yeah, now, even the motion, you felt like you're swimming around when you jump. Right. It's like when Mario jumped before, he seemed to be like 
yeah, it's like you went up, you went down, but here you jump and you see like his feet flutter and he's like, he's like, is he on the moon? Because it's kind of reduced gravity. So um, I went and, and did some research on the game. And first thing that flew me off was uh, if you read Nintendo Power, it says this takes place in a dream. And yep, like, the land, the, the whole land thing's of a dream. Sub, yep, the world, of, the land of subcon or subconscious. Yeah. Yep. So I went back and looked, and um, so like you said, they they had a legitimate sequel to Super Mario Brothers released in Japan. Um, and what happened was Nintendo of America, which is a small fledgling company at the time, basically their you know their United their American arm said, um, yeah, this is way too difficult for our average player, and we want the game to be fun. This isn't fun. It's just you're pulling your hair out because of how difficult it is. They basically took the game, uh, Super Mario Brothers, from where it ended and just continued with it and kept the difficulty going as, it, as, it, as they did. Because um, Japan, Japan's not about fun. It's about... <laughs> It's about mind-numbing difficulty, repetition. Just punishing you constantly. (laughs) Which speaks about their mindset in ways that we can only speculate, but I don't think it's going to take us anywhere good, so we're just not going to look into it. We're just going to pretend it's like, oh, those crazy crazy creative people. So they had made this game called Doki Doki Panic, which um, they made in conjunction with a TV station, Fuji TV, and you put their characters into this game. Um, and it takes place in a book in Arabia about a family trying to save two children. So that's two parents and two kids, and that's how they. Um, so they basically said, "Okay, you don't. You think that the real Super Mario Brothers Two is too difficult? How about we reskin this game?" And they did. So they reskinned it with um, Mario, Luigi, Toad, and the princess. And uh, they changed out a few of um, the sound effects and a few of the um, art, lots of pieces of art, uh, but not a ton. Um, I went back and looked at some Doki Doki Panic videos, and the music is pretty much exactly the same. So the classic theme songs that we think of when we think of Super Mario Bros. 2 actually came from Doki Doki Panic, which I thought was uh, very interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, another thing I've just noticed from the album art um, the uh, art in here that another palette swap thing that shows up is that Mario has yellow gloves. <laughs> now, I think it was trying to identify him with his pixel picture where he has hands the same color as his face. Mm. I don't know why they just didn't give him white, but I figured, you know, maybe three colors at a time is all that they could, they all thought to do. But then instead of, but then he also has white gloves in the same page above. <laughs> where he's just like looking all fat faced and smiling at the camera. Right. Yeah, did you if you flip again, you'll see him in his blue outfit again. You know, I wonder mm-hmm. if um he appears with that in subspace when you use one of the potions or if like, you know, when you do the star man and you get the invincibility if um, when he's flashing, if he flashes to one of those colors and that's where they grabbed it, you know? Maybe. Maybe I, uh... the artist got sent like a screen grab of the middle of one of those things. They're like, ah, that's Mario. (laughs) Or they just figured it's kids. No one's really going to pay attention (laughs) to this. Let's just phone it in. Yeah. Or like, yeah, they're just like, well, I don't agree with their palette (laughs) choices. I'll just pick my own, you know? No, which is strange for a game that really should have been like a misfit. A lot of characters in this have Mm -hmm. become canon, such as the shy guys, Mouser, Birdo, Pokey, the cactus guy, yep. the Babombs, they're friggin' iconic now. They mm-hmm. weren't in the original Mario Brothers, they came out in Mario Brothers 2, but you see them show up in Mario Brothers 3, you just knock them, kick them around, they blow up. And uh, one character that didn't, I haven't seen him around in other ones, but uh, still think it's worth mentioning, was the glowing mask that shows up whenever you <laughs> go into a vase or a room to pick up a key. And even as a kid... When I first played this game, I looked at that and thought, "Why is Jason here?" <laughs> yeah, and then he starts coming. They, uh, he starts coming after you, and you can't. No matter what you do, you can't seem to kill him. And I'm like, "He's unkillable. He has a hockey mask. It's friggin' Jason. What's Jason doing in the Mario Land?" Well, it's clearly his nightmare. I would say that, that would be Freddy. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
I'm just saying that uh, there's a reason they didn't carry him on to the next Mario game, you know? I think but, maybe, um, I think New Line Cinema may have said, like, okay, we, okay, look, we noticed, we let you have one, but come on, everyone's going to know. And that's when they made the Friday the 13th video game, which is hilariously bad. <laughs> which is Which has a purple Jason. Right. But we'll see if Nintendo Power covers that in the future. So let's get into talking about Birdo. So Birdo is the first boss you see. You see him several times in the game. And um, you read Nintendo Power, um, they, they mention him as he. And, yep. they, and the manual says, he thinks he's a girl and shoots eggs from his mouth. Um, so there is a, there's quite a bit of uh, controversy about the gender of Birdo. Yeah, so, he's, is he trans? Or, you know, the right. thing is, if he thinks he's a girl, why is he able to produce eggs? So, I mean, okay. that sounds like the that sounds like the old hypnotist joke of like, Doc, my husband thinks he's a chicken. Well, how do you want me to uh, fix him? I don't want you to f- oh, like. I, or it's like, no. How did it go? Yeah, my doc, uh, my or like the uh, the hypnotist tells the guy he's a chicken, and then he's just like, okay, now I'm going to switch him back. And then the wife says, well, no, we need the eggs. <laughs> so it's like real mind over matter. He thinks he's a girl so much that he's been, that. He's he just been willed a, it. His his cranium is now an ovipositor, mm. and now he can just generate ovum at will. But uh, maybe he's more like a frog, where you can, you don't need another sex to regenerate. Oh yeah, he's like one of the oh yeah, like those clownfish. Right. Whenever the uh, the female of the group dies, the uh, the male no yeah when when the male of the of the school dies, the strongest mm. female just decides. All right, time to time to butch up, and she just becomes bigger, and becomes male. Hmm. So that may be what this guy is. It's possible. I mean, he might be the last of his kind. So you know, it's up to his him to to make yep. the species progress. Unfortunately, yep. he's so dumb he just shoots his eggs out at Mario. <laughs> now, in future uh, games that I've seen, mm-hmm. there's been alluded to that Birdo is Yoshi's girlfriend. Now, <laughs> not. Not boyfriend, girlfriend. Right. So I figure he's trans, and by the time Yoshi meets him, he's fully transitioned. He's post-op. Yep, he's a post-op, and that's why it's okay. Like, Yoshi's mm. not gay, he's just... <laughs> oh, he's, he's not that not there's gay. anything wrong with that. Nope, he's not that there's anything wrong with that, but he's not gay. He's just very... He's just open-minded. I see. So in Japan, apparently, Birdo is, is named Catherine. Wow. And, um, he has frequently stated that he is a male. Uh, he's always depicted as a female after this game, and he's voiced by uh, a woman, the same woman who voices Peach in all like the Super Smash Brothers games and, and mm. all that. Uh, in Super Smash Brothers Brawl, it states that Birdo's gender is indeterminate and refers to him slash her as it. As far as far as Yoshi's concerned, a mouth is a mouth. Well, apparently, <laughs> and what a, a big mouth. one that can spit out eggs. <laughs> Well, so, now we know. Now, now we know he spits, right? <laughs> so that's Birdo for you. Yep. So moving on into the rest of the issue, uh, there's anything else you want to talk about with Mario Two? Uh, yes, there was the next page where it says like Mar- Super Mario Brothers Two Sports Festival. Now it's just a whole bunch of crude drawings where shot guys don't even have white masks, and it's just. Uh, all the characters displaying their jumping ability, where Peach has the long jump ability, Luigi has the high jump ability, and Toad is just great at picking stuff up. Now, below him is a Birdo who, for copyright reasons, I have to I have to say he's a copyright violation of Qbert. <laughs> yeah, because, he's kind of got that cannon nose. Yeah, mouth he doesn't. Thing he going doesn't. On. He doesn't have a snout. He has a friggin' open beak thing yeah. and he's shooting up like three marbles at a time like it's Q-Bird and marble madness and he's doing a uh, shot put <laughs> yeah he just can't be stopped yeah i mean this whole art it just looks like fan art honestly it does not look like yeah. a professional job now the rest now as for the coverage of the game i don't really have too many comments aside from telling us showing us right from the very start complete maps fantastic mm-hmm. coverage letting us know which places are shortcuts so that... Because, mm-hmm. you know, without Nintendo Power, if you saw a pit, what's your first impulse? Avoid it. Sure. 
And then you would see someone else play it, and you'd be like, Don't go in there, you retard! And then there's like a whole new level, and you're like, Okay, I guess I'm the retard. Yeah, I remember looking at the 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 take if it says take a shortcut here on World One One. At the very end of the of the level, you get to it and you climb the ladder down and you see the door to exit the level on the other side of a brick wall. And you're just kind of looking at it, going, "What the hell?" You know? Are yeah. they just are they the creators just trolling me here? And you yeah. try to like <laughs> jump and you can't get in and no matter what, right? You've got well, a limited supply of bombs and when you throw them, they just don't. It's not just that. I mean, you have to time the bomb yeah, throw to, just yeah. so, so it bounces off of the lower ground. Or, or you, cook, you cook the grenade correct. and just wait for it. Just think like, all right, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, and just hope that nobody distracts you and makes you lose count so that you yeah. don't let go of the son of a bitch. I mean, this is the first level, so this is this is why I got so frustrated with the game myself, and I was like, yeah. all right, this is not a buy for me. And for me at the time, because I said I lived overseas, for me to say I wanted a game means I had to beg my parents for months and then maybe get it at like one game over Christmas or my <laughs> so, birthday. Yeah. So yeah. the games were, so <laughs> just like me, you were Whenever someone a- had to go, actually went back to the United States, you know, and, and flew back. Because you couldn't just, it was not like the internet today where you can just order something online and get it to you, or even a catalog. You know, you didn't uh, know someone that was going overseas. That's where this game, that's where this magazine came in handy for me, because games were so few and far between. It's not mm-hmm. like you had, like, we did like, we had a very poor family, so I had to get most of my games by watching my friend, like, going over to my friend's place and maybe borrowing a game, or later on renting it. So, right. seeing how to enjoy a game rather than like I don't I just don't have the ability to get this game and play with it myself. Right. So seeing this made me like, all right, this game is doable. I can have it in a day and get it done. But that was before Mario two came along. So I just had to watch my friends play who either through trial and error or having their own Nintendo power, watch them play through the game and take their advice as I try to take on like the three-headed triclides or whatever. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's move, let's move on to past Mario 2. Sure. Um, so they talk about Zelda, the second quest. And for those of you not familiar, the original Legend of Zelda, when you beat the game the first time, um, it allows you to, to start the game again. And uh, a lot of times this is referred to as New Game Plus these days. Um, but for this game, this is probably one of the first of its, time, of its kind you can start the game again in something called the second quest. Otherwise and, known uh, as hard mode. Yeah, it's um, basically the map is fairly similar um, to, the, to the original one, but the, where dungeons are is very different, and a lot of things that were shops before or things that helped you, like fairies in the first game, are now punishments. You were one specific guy, and they, they detail it in here. Uh, you go into his room, and uh, he says something like uh, either... Give me a heart container or pay me fifty rupees. <laughs> and <laughs> oh uh, I remember, I remember playing this, and, and I was just like, "Well, you're not getting any of those from me, right?" <laughs> so I tried to leave, and um, he just straight up murders you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pay you. You, 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 gas, grass, or ass. No one yeah. leaves for free. <laughs> the uh, the door locks, and he has like these two like you know burning bushes next to him, and they just like target you and shoot you and kill you. <laughs> so so he's dark moses yeah he's he's the he does look like moses actually he's, he's evil moses that's exactly who he is i i need to use this actually because i tried playing zelda but mm-hmm. again due to the constraints i've previously mentioned i never actually got to play the thing to completion i and without any narration you know how damn hard zelda is because it's so expansive, which is a good thing, but again, with such an open world, but with no con- no guidance, right. it's just overwhelming. I'm just like, I'm walking around, I'm getting worn down by these assholes, occasionally I find a hard container, and then I find a level, and apparently I don't have what it takes to get through it, because everything is so damn hard. Right. Well, I just remember going around through the entire game with bombs, trying to bomb every single rock and bush <laughs> to try to find a secret passage. You because know? there's I mean, yeah, there's no indication, no like it. Oh, what happens in Legend of Zelda: A Link to the Past? 
which is great. Not only does the higher resolution allow you to see cracks in the wall, but if you know that there's a hidden wall, you can just run along tapping it with your sword. Right. And you hear ding, 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 ding. And you're like, all right, time to whip out the hardware. And then, right. you, make a, and then you make a hole. Here, either technical limitations or just failure of creativity, <laughs> you just had to... You just have to have someone tell you, you blow up that certain rock or you move that certain tombstone. Right. Like, you have an entire square and multiple squares on the map of trial mm-hmm. and error to work with. So, did so you got to beat Zelda? Did you have help before? Or did you just, like, have a very good summer to figure it out? Um, I believe I had uh, help of some kind to in order to get through. It took me a long time. Oh, yeah. And I had to like write, you know, especially for like the Lost Woods or whatever it's called, I had to uh, write down or use the map in order to get through it. Um, it was it was difficult to get through. Oh, yeah, because um, again, so, such a little context or guidance in the yeah. game. Basically, if you don't have outside help, you're mm-hmm. boned. You're, you're boned like a Stelphos. And uh, for any listeners out there, if you want to skip straight to the second quest and just go for straight for hard mode, just when you type in your name, when you enter a new game, type in Zelda as the name, and that'll start you straight off into second quest mode, which is uh, extremely difficult. And kind of, it was for me, I mean, sure, in today's world, there's people that love to love a challenge, but for me, I was just like, all right, that's enough. This is ridiculous. I'm moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, okay, I'm ex- like, especially if you try to earn it through the first quest first. And you're like, okay, this was big. Where, where's the payoff? And then right. you immediately don't have much time to recover. Mm-hmm. And then they're just like, hey, let's make it even more difficult. So this second, so this coverage really helps. And because the maps are pretty much the same, I think that you could use this to play through the first quest, but it will be a little inaccurate. Right. Yeah, the locations of everything are different, but you can but at least see the layout of the of they, the game. They are good enough to tell you that this is where level two used to be. So, right, yeah. that's true. All right, anything uh, else on Zelda I, Second Quest? Uh, the one thing I have to mention mm-hmm. is the end, where it shows level nine. It uh, shows a big question mark on the overworld map. You know, for something that's supposed to be in-depth coverage, they really cheap out at the hardest friggin' part. They show you the over the dungeon map, but <laughs> not in, not in detail, just the silhouette, and you get to see it's Ganon's head. Yep. And they tell you that you don't get it, you don't get in if you don't have the eight pieces of the Triforce with Evil Moses guarding it. <laughs> right. And it says Ganon waits for you. This is a monstrous labyrinth with forty-six rooms. Now, 46 rooms, kudos on you for pushing the technical limits of the game and giving us such an expansive place to uh, play around with. But shame on you, Nintendo Power Magazine, for not showing us these 46 friggin' rooms, because that's a lot of trial and error. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is this is where I really need you to have my back. And you're just like, it's just like your friend is priming you up for a fight like okay you push that bully i'll got your back i got your back i got your back and then like he'll throw in a punch or two but as soon as the bully's friend comes in that's when you're just like okay man it's all you it's all you i got your back man it's all you how can you how can you have my back if it's all me i think they probably gave up at this point trying to beat the game they're like all right we gotta print this thing let's get it out there miyamoto's not answering our phone calls so. <laughs> but they did finish the page since it's not going to be covering the level, which would be helpful, right. what it does tell you is, did you defeat Ganon successfully? Are you waiting for more exciting action, right. danger, and adventure? Sell Get me. ready. Because Zelda 2 is coming. Zelda 2? Yep. The Adventures of Link. Wow. Tell me more. <laughs> the Overworld. You will be traveling to a far more vast overworld. Oh. And do you like spells? How about, do you have real fighting scenes? Oh, well, you bet. You bet. Instead of just looking over Link's head, now you can see him stab people in the face from the side. Oh, nice. Well, that sounds exciting. I can't wait to go over that uh, in issue four. And would you, would, you, would you like to talk to people who probably have mental illness? No, not at all. Well, too bad, because you're going to greet a villager who calls himself a mistake. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. Oh, we got to talk about the centerfold of the of the magazine. Oh, the three page map. So the this big... is the yeah. Did you notice the bat signal by the way? Hmm. Was it? No, no, not, not the not the. Uh, if you skip past the rest of uh, Zelda, and you go to the centerfold map um, poster. So every yes, Nintendo the... Power, for listeners out there who haven't opened Nintendo Power, every Nintendo Power had a three page fold out centerfold poster that you could Where... tear out or take the staples out of the poster. And, and they deliver the they deliver the goods. So the the first issue. They'd mentioned baseball on the front cover briefly, and now they're they're really bringing it home. They've got this big poster of a uh, player throwing a baseball, Among uh, wearing other things. a yeah, wearing a <laughs> Nintendo oh. uniform. So you know he's from the best team, he's from the Nintendo team. And uh, there's a baseball a bat flying. There's a smushed baseball. Yeah, there's a he, hot dog. He's th- he's throwing a baseball among other things. There's peanuts. There's three different. Uh, baseball video games, um, and then below him, he's just floating in the air above like a stadium. Yeah, yeah. he's like a, a massive super. <laughs> go- he's like the god of of throwing things. He is throwing food, packing peanuts, uh, Jaleco bases loaded, RBI yep. baseball from Tengen, and another one. I believe it's yeah, official license Major League Baseball from mm-hmm. the video game from the Angry Video Game Nerd's favorite studio. LJN. Oh, LJN. Nice <laughs> drop there. And he's got like a constellation of a of a baseball diamond behind him in the sky for some reason. Um, well, like, my, like I said, he's he's the god. He's the god of, of velocity. He is throwing velocity. anything can, anything that can be thrown. He is surrounded by it. He empowers motion. Yeah, there's a little uh, diagram next to the baseball bat that says. Uh, it's like this dotted uh, graph line that says 90 degrees. Oh, and yeah. on the other side, it says hit. So you know yep. if you got a right angle that you're going to be hitting the baseball. And not just yep. hitting it, but blowing it up and inside the baseball. Yep. You're going to find some LJN baseball goodness yep. popping oh, out yeah. of it. And at the very bottom, we have a blimp saying home run. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you can achieve a home run with the implement this guy is using. Which is a it looks like he's uh, swinging a red rope around. It's a Twizzler. <laughs> he's swinging a Twizzler bat, <laughs> and somehow Batman. God, that sounds delicious. And somehow Batman is being summoned to the scene. Mm-hmm. I I guess he's like a villain that beats people to death with a giant licorice bat. And Batman, is, get it, Batman. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I think now. Uh, so All the right. so the god of velocity is pleased, right? And. And then on the next page is Baseball Roundup, which is more coverage on baseball games. And I don't give a crap about sports, and I give even less of a crap. I I I take it. I give inverted no. craps. I absorb feces when it comes to sports games, especially the uh, well, basically Nintendo, because mm-hmm. it just gives me more room in the video store to pass over. Mm-hmm. to get actual games to play. So do you have anything to say about the sports? Because I'm out. Well, we can get through it pretty quickly. But I mean, what I found interesting besides there, these giant flags that say, awesome graphics, pro, pro players, all-star <laughs> lineup. Um, they, they're they kind of doing three games together. But they're three separate baseball games released around the same time, I have to imagine. And the Nintendo Power is attempting desperately to cover all three of these games at the same time. So they have multiple spreads where they are talking about uh, all three games independently about how to how to play through them. And they have sort of these crudely drawn illustrations of a coach and a pitcher uh, and a batter. So, so crude I could draw them. Yeah, I mean, uh, going through and, you know, it's kind and of every, like they go, well, here's batting, here's pitching, here's home runs, and, and uh, yeah, and there we go, here's the end of the game, and here's and some screen caps. Everyone's nose is a is a hot dog. Or a, yeah, it's or sort a of like a, like a pickle. Yeah, especially with the eyes mm-hmm. above, then it just looks like a, <laughs> it looks like a crotch shot of a dude. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, and, so if you're uh, into that kind of thing, you should read the baseball section for sure. Because I don't give a shit. Now, the next part is the Counselor's real money. corner. The money section for me, because this is where I got, whenever I was stuck, this was always like one of the first places I would look. Oh, for now, sure. Ghosts and Goblins is the first game covered. 
Now, I tried it. I love the idea, but I just hated the difficulty of it. But uh, now, Super that hard. I have, now that I'm a bit older, I need to try it again. And I definitely need to try Zelda just so I can beat the thing and maybe use the map. And, like, it's just something I've got to do. One thing I don't have to do is the next game, Ring King, which to me looks like well, a shitty... Hold on. Before you get into Ring King, let's talk about the directions for uh, game codes back in the day. So nowadays, when you want to, you know, there's not a whole lot of cheats left in, in newer games because they made them such are so approachable. Yeah, yeah there's something normally you unlock, it's like, or you may uh, you unlock them, or you can download them. Yeah, normally it's like a it's something hidden in the game that's not necessarily that difficult to find, or you know how to do it. It's just grinding through and and yeah. doing it all. Or they're but, collectibles uh, and stuff. Right. So this one is 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 asking for how do, how do I get a stage select, which is literally just a feature of the game it's not even cheating it's just like yeah, how do i and, play a specific level and you think like, i have a limited controller so there shouldn't be too many right. inputs right mm -hmm. i have an up down left right i have select and i have start that's six buttons so i just have to tap like one or two of them and right. i should be fine right so well, this is like uh you know opening a lock uh, to a very uh, secure bank vault, essentially. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just want to read. I'll just want to read this out one time, and then we'll get past it. Hold the control pad right and push the B button three times. Then push up and release. Next, push B three times. Push left, release. Then B three times again. Push down, release, and push B three more times. Then push start. Select the A or B button at this time and push start once again. Now you're on the right track. <laughs> what? Oh yeah. So even che even cheating is a fucking is a friggin' Herculean ordeal. Man, I thought the Konami code was difficult. That's that's something out of this world. Uh. Ugh. Yep. And then uh, you get to f uh, tells you how to fight the Red Devil, and uh, basically what they're giving you is a glitch, not an actual strategy because you <laughs> don't glitch. you you don't beat him. You just mm -hmm. have to find a way to hit him, knock him off screen, and then hopefully when the screen <laughs> transitions again. He's been glitched out of existence. You know, and those, be, those and days, be because of the difficulty, you just did what you had to do. Yep. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they had in a later feature issue, they have the uh, Blaster Master pause glitch in here as a way to actually beat a boss. <laughs> Honor is for the proud. You yes. are not proud. So here, I like some of the, the questions in here, like uh, about Metroid, for example. It's just, just kind of sad. It just says, in Metroid, I have a hard time finding the power-up items. I usually get wiped out before I find them. Can you help? And you kind of just want to be like, you know, if you really, that you're, that's sort of the core of the game. And if yeah. you're having a problem with the core of the game, it either is not for you or go buy our like complete guide, you know? Yeah, but they're kind enough. Now for Castle's Corner, they get really in-depth and give you an entire map of the entire game. Unfortunately, it's so t so small. Each room is so tiny to fit yeah. the entire world onto this page that if you need a magnifying lens to pretty much figure out, is that a ledge? But they yeah. tell you where to get the long beam, the various suit, the bomb, the ice beam, and other things. Now, yeah, my favorite, the screw attack. <laughs> I never got to play Metroid. This was one of the big things. And uh, I saw a Let's Play of it. And mm -hmm. it looked kind of pretty challenging and difficult. So, you it's know, hard. I, got, I got to see this story, and I'm good. I'm I'm fine with my first Metroid game being Super Metroid. Mm -hmm. God bless that game. That was friggin' it was huge, but it was challenging, but not like smack you in the face and discourage you from playing it. Everything like the music, the sound effects, the footsteps. It was just a technical. If there was a video game for this, if there was a Super Nintendo game with the word Super in it, mm -hmm. man, they meant it. Oh, for sure. So what about you with Metroid? Did you take a stab at it? I have it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was really hard. I don't think I ever um, beat it, to be honest. I actually think I got to the end, but not without some serious help. Um, I learned about a cheat. You can enter the name of the main character as your name, and it kind of skips you to the end of the game. That's the only way I ever ever got very far. Did and you honestly, ever? This is this game was kind of scary. Did you ever uh, enter? Did you ever enter in the Justin Bailey cheat? Or? That's what I meant is the Justin Bailey cheat. So you get to see somewhat naked Samus, <laughs> or at least unarmored Samus, where she kind of looks like an eighty sci-fi 
like an 80s sci-fi space fixin. Right. Like the time that always has like a gun, but it's a gun that's attached to a cable to a power pack on the back because apparently it's just that good of a blaster yeah. that it needs a massive power source and got like the pink leather, the pink leotards with the big hair. Mm-hmm. So which makes you wonder how she crammed it in that helmet in the first place. <laughs> but again, yeah. with with it off, she looks like she belongs on the cover of like uh, Space Age or Space Race or whatever that Dragon's Lair sequel was. Right. Well, I mean, I remember being pleasantly surprised about that. I thought that was pretty cool that they they did that because you, it was surprising, um, especially yeah. for you are a young empower- adolescent as myself. Yeah. You know, you're you expected are, to be a, a dude. You yeah, know, you are a young, you are an empowered, capable, independent woman. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it sends a good message. And it really should have been put in other games like uh, in recent games, they have like Super Princess Peach, where Princess Peach has to save Mario. And I played the game, and let me tell you, I I was not afraid to get in touch with my emotions I as see. a woman and become a horrifying rage monster or a weepy mess. So I have Lovely. to say, I have to say that Samus was a better representation of independent women than Princess Peach was, That's since her true. her powers were crying and running, mm. <laughs> and uh, being. Was there also, f- you know, coincidentally, my real life strengths as well? Is crying and running, <laughs> so well, often then, at the same time. Well, then there you go. So she's, her and I have a lot in common. So she's bridging the gender gaps. Right. <laughs> so moving on to Super Mario Brothers. Mm-hmm. Are there really unlimited one-ups? Can you tell me how to get the fireworks and what do they mean? Now, I'm surprised I didn't ask about World Negative 1, but that's really not helpful because it just glitches you into into drowning. But I could never nail the one-up on the pyramid with the Koopa going down the, uh, going down the pyramid mm-hmm. and jumping on his shell and nailing the one-up ad infinitum. Mm. But uh, I used to watch other people and have them do it for me because I just didn't have the dexterity. Do yeah, you, I couldn't uh, do it either. No, you you couldn't look into the infinite one ups. No, I I knew someone that could do a few and then they die, you know, at a certain point. Um, but I like this note here in, in where it says you may want to stop building lives at around one hundred. If you get too greedy, the program has a built in game over. So if you try and get over hundred one ups, it, it's game over for you. I thought that was pretty yeah. funny. Oh, it is good that they warn you about a glitch that will screw you. Now, Kid Icarus, I never played the game. I had a friend who played it, but I always watched him play it because I never got what you were doing or why. And he looked kind of stupid on the uh, old Captain N cartoon. So I just never thought, I just never saw why Kid Icarus was a decent game to play. Have you ever played it? Um, I've played the uh, Game Boy game, um, funny enough, but I never never got a chance to play uh, the Nintendo version. I didn't know anyone who had it, and it was kind of like it, it came out before I, I got a Nintendo and didn't come with it, and it was kind of one of those things that just passed Pass- me by. Yeah, so I'm going to, that's another, once I start playing my Nintendo ROMs, I'm just going to have to play these classics ju- mm. just to just to get some closure on the past. Right. Now, at the bottom is a game that I immedi- I initially dismissed, but then I saw further mentions of it later on in the uh, game, and the pictures of it, at least one video, one picture of it, looks pretty cool. It's called Rygar. Now, I had never heard of this until reading this magazine, but uh, there's a picture of it where there seems to be like this uh, flying fortress mm-hmm. thing and a uh, chain of some kind, like a giant flyswatter. <laughs> yeah, I had Rygar. The game is awesome. Uh, you have a uh, shield on like a a, um, a cable kind of thing, and it's kind of like it works like a boomerang where you fling it out in front of you and it comes back to you. And uh, it has a really addictive uh, soundtrack. And they actually had it's a port of an arcade game actually. Um, the arcade game has better graphics, same uh, soundtrack. Um, but the NES one is pretty faithful to the original. Uh, it's a great game. It's it's kind of like a mix between like a platformer action RPG. There's some RPG elements in it. Well, can you uh, sum up the uh, plot of the game? I have no idea. 
<laughs> they had I a. Uh, yeah. I, I, pl- I played a game with that name. I uh, I played it. A, a lot of these games don't have. I mean, you probably have to read the manual to learn the plot. They didn't have a whole lot of exposition in the game itself. You know, you, you're f- searching for something. Uh, was Rygar's deal? They actually had a um, a sequel to Rygar uh, many years later for the PlayStation Two. It was called Rygar: The Legendary Adventures, I think. Um, and it was totally 3D. It was uh, amazing. I did a really faithful update to the game, and you know, gave it story and all kind of thing. Uh, it's all. Um, backed in, in in Greek mythology. Um so if you ever have haven't checked out the PS2 version of that, that's pretty good. Now the next game is a very prominent game that even I heard of, except I never got to play it because I just never got to own the game, but it's just one of these things I gotta tackle, Castlevania. Now did you ever try the Castlevania series on the NES? Yeah, I had uh friends with Castlevania one. And uh, it was pretty hard, but it was a good, good game. It was fun. Never had it for myself. They have friends with Castlevania 2, and that was near impossible. It was uh, very that, difficult. That's the one introduction I had to the series. And after trying to play it or having the uh, day and night change on me, mm-hmm. I was just like, I don't know what the deal is with this game. It seems like it could be good. But it's it's just punishing me more than rewarding me. It is. And yeah. I gave up on the series. I, it was sad to judge it because it was the weakest entry, but it was the one I had the experience with because it's the one my friend had. So I gave up on it, except when, once again, Super Castlevania. <laughs> and when that game came out, the graphics, I was just like, I got to get a hold of this. And when I rented it, Oh my gee, this <laughs> game, friggin', I loved horror, Dracula, mummies, vampires, werewolves, Frankenstein, and this game brought it all with a kick-ass soundtrack, uh, that was Mode 7 graphics of bosses that would, like, yep. rotate when they die, and I was just blown away, like, the clocks, the stairs, it was everything that the NES should have delivered to me, but without all the punishing, horrible awfulness that this game delivered. And Super well, Castlevania can't recommend that one enough. It's a shame you, you didn't uh, experience Castlevania 3, which is actually my favorite of a lot of the Castlevania games. Uh, not as much as Symphony of the Night, but that's a whole different level. Uh, the original ones, Castlevania 3, is probably my favorite. Um, you get to play as different characters, and there's a branching storyline. Um, it's, it's, it is difficult, but it's, it's rewarding. I, my experience with Castlevania 3 was somewhat positive, but from a distance. I saw Dwayne and Brando's cover of Final Fantasy 3, and the music in it from one, to, from one place to another is just exhilarating and awesome. And watching other uh, uh, video coverage, like because sometimes they amp up the music for their rap videos, but mm-hmm. seeing what this, uh, seeing the music in its raw form for the Nintendo, and like it was just so rocking and fantastic. I'm just like, I- is this Nintendo sound? Because there wasn't too many problems with the Nint- with Nintendo. They did a lot with their limitations, but mm-hmm. even even the rock. Like symphonic rock, almost metal soundtrack to number three, it just seemed unreal. Like it couldn't be this good. Okay, so Ikari Warriors. There's nothing we can say here that wasn't mentioned in the Angry Video Game Nerds review. This game is awful, and the only thing worse than the game's unrelenting difficulty was the stage select, where. <laughs> It even tells you you have to go fast because <laughs> it doesn't. It barely gives you enough time to input all the commands, and I'm not going to tell you what they are. You just have to watch the nerd figure it out. It is that's funny, fantastic, and it's got one of the best songs in in, in nerd history. Now, by nerd you mean the angry video game nerd, right? Yep, James. Uh, forgot his last name, but. The Angry Video Game Nerd. Mm-hmm. Now, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out is... But hold on, but back to Akari Ak- Warriors. Um, this game's only worth playing if you either know the continue uh, a code, which is over here, 
or if you play on the original arcade version and you have a ton of quarters. Uh, it's an arcade <laughs> port, and it is pretty fun, but it is a total quarter eater. Um, and it's kind of like just sort of like a scrolling version of a top-down version of Contra where you're constantly dying and getting shot, and you have to put it into the quarter to continue. So, yeah, there's there's other games like that where you do right. the scrolling overhead where you take on a massive army, you collect power-ups, you get hit, and you lose all of them and have to try to scramble before right. you get murderized in your weakened state. I do wonder if the continue code was a uh, a met, was a, a nice gl- uh, glance at the uh, creator's favorite disco group because it's ABBA. <laughs> Dancing Queen. (laughs) And the final coverage, the final covered game is Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Now, I felt this because, god damn it, this guy pulverized me. I was Evander Holyfield's ear. This guy (laughs) just chewed me up and spit me out. Now, if I had this issue, I would have won the belt. I would have been, I, I would have had this thing put to bed. But as soon as I start it, I'm just mentally exhausted from beating Glass Joe, the uh, Turkish bull guy, King Hippo, mm. uh, Don Flamenco. I am just exhausted. My palms mm. are sweaty. And then this guy comes up, and before I can get used to him, bam, 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 down for the count. And he's doing that friggin' winking thing with the gap tooth, and he's just dancing around. And I'm trying right. to get up and staggering, and then he's just like, oh, did you come up with the man? Bam! And then he's just like, there, that's where you go, because you're a loser. And... <laughs> Mike Tyson impression is pretty good, i got to say. <laughs> Thank you. I, I try to do it very good, because, you know, if I don't, then, you know, people might start laughing at me. Nice. So, this tells you how to beat Tyson. Now, it says, like, you do it by using... by knocking out his ability to use his dynamite punch. Don't let him land one in the first minute and a half in a round. So, essentially, this is just like fighting the real Mike Tyson, because the key is, don't let him knock you out. Mm-hmm. Watch for Which, when he winks. Yeah. yeah. Don't let him knock you out. Okay. And uh, essentially, the key to beating him is just like how actual fighters beat him by tiring him out, because the mm. real Mike Tyson has asthma. So, mm. he had to put all of his power into his initial attacks so that the fight doesn't last long because he would start losing breath, getting dizzy, and the arms would come down, and those are how he lost his actual Hmm. matches, by getting tired, and they pulverized him. And if you you fight him as you would the real Tyson, by defending and dodging until he wears himself out, then he becomes viable to be defeated. Yeah, I I couldn't even get past uh, Soda Pop Joe or whatever his name was. You couldn't get past Soda Popinski? No, I couldn't even get past Soda Popinski in this game. I had it, and I thought it was fun, but it was was hard. I couldn't couldn't get past Soda Pop. Oh, man, this was... (laughs) I had friends I could get get to Tyson. This was the game I could get to to the game, and then he just friggin' beat me like I owed him money. Nice. So this is the end of the Counselor's Corner, and I think we'll be wrapping up this episode. It was quite a chat, and uh, to keep these episodes small, we'll see if we can review one episode per, or maybe it'll be two episodes per. And uh, the last yeah, part... The, the early magazines, because they're bi-monthly, might be twice as big as the later mm-hmm. ones. And the first issue especially just has a lot of meat to it. So I think we, we owe it another... another, another yep. uh, full hour or so So, to to get through it so next episode we will be discussing we will be starting off with howard and nestor a staple for those who remember nintendo power magazine they would be like hey you got a magazine full of information tips and tricks here's a comic with information tips and tricks and a little bit of humor and Mm -hmm. it was a very we'll get into that at the beginning of this uh at the beginning of episode one, part two, or episode two, whatever. We'll 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 figure it out later. Part two, uh, as they call it. So, Mike, <laughs> yeah. how can they get a hold of us in the meantime? Well, we are on Facebook at the Playing With Power podcast on Facebook. And you can send us an email at playingwithpowerpodcast at gmail.com. I'll work on a Twitter later. 
<laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, so please send us any ideas, comments you have. If you, t- if you found us, let us know how you found us. Uh, we're just starting out, so I pre- appreciate you listening in and sticking with us. <laughs> if you found us before we release episode two, yeah, that's uh, not likely. <laughs> that's not likely. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, let's sign off. I'm Mike. And I'm Ben. And now you're playing with power. <laughs> Entertainment system. Now you're playing with power.